we've gone over uh, the basics of aerobic cellular respiration, glycolysis, the first stage of aerobic cellular respiration, where you're going to break glucose in half to create pyruvate. We talked about how pyruvate gets broken down into acetyl coenzyme A, and then how that acetyl coenzyme A goes into the Krebs cycle to produce FADH2, GTP, um, NADH, and carbon dioxide. We're now moving into the final step of aerobic cellular respiration, which is oxidative phosphorylation. Um, using a chemiosmotic gradient, so using an electrochemical gradient to power phosphorylation, adding a phosphate to ADP. For this whole process, start to finish, right now, how many ATP have we built? Not trying to trick you. Two ATP have been built so far. So far, how many FADH2? FADH2. One, but remember, cranks through twice. So we have two FADH2. How many GTP? Two GTP. And now, the hard question, and a very important question. How many NADH? Total. Eight, I got one answer of eight. Nine is another answer. Seven. So we got what, seven, eight, nine, okay. You can go with one, sure. It's like Price is Right, right? You'll go with 10? 10, 10, go, you're like, just go with her. Do you agree? Brenna agrees, all right, 10? Eight? So we got seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> and one. Twelve just for funsies. All right, let's, I'll, I'll count now. How many are here? Two. Two. How many are here? Two. How many are here? One, two, three, but, three. but it goes through twice. Oh, so six. Equals? 10 NADH. So far, so good? 10 NADH. All right, remember, FADH2 and NADH carry really excited electrons that want to do some work. Okay? Can I erase this part? Okay, I'll wait for a second. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? So the, ones, the really energetic ones are the NADH and the FGH. Really These are the, they're the energetic electrons that we're going to use in the next part. The ATP, the GTP, they've all gone off and they're going to start building things on their own. We're getting ready to move these FADHs and these uh, NADHs somewhere else. Good to go? All right. Last step, step four, oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is where you're going to take high energy electrons from the Krebs cycle and use them to power the electron transport chain. So we've made NADH and FADH2 here in the mitochondrion. Uh, those energy transport molecules are gonna go up to the membrane, so I'm gonna sort of Get rid of this, I'm going to just create what that membrane looks like, okay? So sort of zooming in. This is a really big view of the mitochondrion, the edge of the mitochondria. Here is the lumen on the inside. This is what's called the intermembrane space. So down here is where we have the Krebs cycle, right there. It's produced a bunch of NADH. It's produced a bunch of FADH2. We are going to move the NADH, 
carrying its electrons and FADH2 to the electron transport chain. Now the electron transport chain is made up of molecules. Generally, they're uh, attached to uh, transmembrane proteins. Oof, another big word, what's a transmembrane protein? That's exactly what, sorry, I know we did learn all of this already. They are proteins that span the membrane. So if you have these things embedded in the membrane, sort of like that. These drop off their highly energetic electron. So if the electron is moving from here to here, what has this molecule been? So it's reduced because it's gaining the electron. So this picks up an electron. All right, that electron can do work. The work that that electron does is it pushes hydrogen across that barrier. Okay, yes? Against the gradient, that's where you're using the energy. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a hydrogen gradient over here. Yes, this is primary active, that's exactly what this is, all right? So you can see where it's all coming together, right? Yeah. Um, that's why I had to teach you all that other stuff to get through this. Um, all right, now, the, mole the, the molecule next to it, the, uh, this piece going through the membrane, has higher electronegativity than the one before it. So what does it do to that electron? It takes it, so the electron jumps. Then it goes to this molecule, and what does it do? it pushes hydrogen across. The one next to it is even more electronegative than that one. So what does it do? Steals the electron, pushes hydrogen across. Until the molecule reaches, I'm sorry, until um, it reaches the most electronegative element that we have studied in this class, which is what? Oxygen. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. We've created an electrochemical gradient here. The electron jumps to oxygen, O2, and that oxygen gets converted into water. This is why you breathe. Literally, that reaction right there is why you need oxygen. Yes? So how can you say that part of the word recalibration? I'll go through it again, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll definitely go through it several more times, truthfully. This is big picture. You create an electrochemical gradient, and you've converted oxygen into water. Yes? That's a good question. I don't know what the pH level is in there, because what happens is, almost as soon as you build this gradient, you use the energy of the gradient for the next step. So this is not going to stay high. Yes? QB, is that listed there? Where do you see a Q? So that Q, Q is one of these. One of these, but I'm not gonna ask you. Q and cytochrome C and all of the names of it, I don't, that's, that's too specific for me. I guys want you guys to understand the big picture, which is you have an electron transport chain powering this pushing of hydrogen across the gradient. Right, so big picture, guys. What's going on is you're taking the electrons from the FADH2 and the NADH. Those electrons are getting past these molecules. These molecules are then pushing hydrogen across the barrier. Each time that happens, the electron jumps to a molecule with a higher electronegativity. Until it reaches the absolute final electron acceptor, which is oxygen. I cannot stress enough that you guys understand that oxygen is the final electron acceptor, and that is the reason you breathe. That is the whole reason you take oxygen into your body, is to power this reaction. So 
Yeah. Say that again. What do you mean? The, are you talking about oxygen? Yes. So we're not producing oxygen. We never produce oxygen. It's, it's become, yeah, it's converted into water, and that's a waste product. Um, How does that convert into water? Because when you, when you reduce oxygen, it becomes water. Because then it becomes more receptive to hydrogen. Yep. You could look at it that way, yeah. So what you're doing is you're moving hydrogen across this barrier, creating an electrochemical gradient. Where does the hydrogen want to go? you got lots of hydrogen up here, no hydrogen down there. It wants to come back, and it wants to do that because of diffusion. Right? Problem is, this is a semi-permeable membrane. It's not letting the hydrogen through. The only way for hydrogen to get through is uh, to go through another molecule, another uh, protein, set of proteins, called ATP synthase. So here you might have the ATP synthase popping through, which point the hydrogen molecule stream through. Like that. ATP synthase works almost like a water wheel. Do you guys know where a water wheel is in a river? So as you've got water, a river flowing, if you put a wheel in it, that wheel begins to spin pushed by the flow of the river. If the river's moving in this direction, the wheel gets pushed that way and up and around. So you're converting the movement of these hydrogen ions into mechanical energy, kinetic, the, the energy of motion. Yeah. Which is secondary transport, yeah, exactly right. So you're pushing this wheel around, and as that wheel gets pushed, it's taking an adenosine diphosphate and a phosphate and putting them together. This is extremely efficient. So you're now able to take the energy from these NADHs and these FADH2s, convert it into that, put it into that electron transport chain, push that hydrogen across, as that hydrogen streams through, it converts ADP into ATP. But it's not just a little, it's a lot. This uh, ATP synthase is extremely efficient. It's got three uh, set phases to it. So if you watch it, check this out. So let's say we got an adenosine diphosphate here. This pen is an adenosine diphosphate. Its cap is a phosphate. So the first step, I'll be the ATP synthase because that's how cool I am. The ADP and the phosphate bind to the ATP synthase, phase one. Phase two, it starts to spin because of that hydrogen. Then that brings the ADP and the phosphate close together, binding them. As it spins again, that's released which means you get back to the first conformation where you can bind a new phosphate and a new ADP. So one, two, three. Does that make sense? Are enzymes this at all? No, not this step. Okay. You don't, and that's the big difference between substrate level and oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is where you're using the power of that gradient to power that ATP synthase. Substrate level is where you have an enzyme doing it all. I would not consider it net. Well, I mean, it would reduce the energy you need to bind the two. So you could consider it that. It, that. It's an enzyme that has to be powered by something. Right. Yes. Is that where recycling comes into Recycling, as in, like, we're, what do you mean by recycling? It's released. Yes, you're converting ADP into ATP. And then that ATP, after it is uh, involved in a hydrolysis reaction, becomes ADP again, and it comes back here to get repowered. It's, instead of recycling, think of it more like a battery charger. Yes? This is all step four. 
which is the last step, which is the last step. So the net result of the whole, that, that, that was it. That was the last step. And by the way, this is the hardest thing you will learn all semester. It doesn't get any worse. Unless you don't like math, at which point maybe genetics is worse. But I think this is probably the worst. Uh, net result is you're now producing 30 to 34 ATP from this process. You're taking the energy of one molecule of glucose and through this whole step, all, all four steps, converting it into 30 to 34 ATP. It depends on how efficient the system is. Um, there are going to be different environmental factors going on. Um, you may, um, it may not be hot enough or maybe too hot. The shape uh, of the enzymes involved in these processes might change, which means it's going to be less um, efficient. Would you age off the it, it might. I, honestly, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. Yes. This is part of that overall, yeah. Like overall yep. So you're making a bunch, a whole lot. But most of it is coming from the later you can see why this is so important. This is what gave us a major evolutionary edge. Whereas all the other organisms were chugging along, just doing glycolysis. We're going to learn that cycle in just a minute. Um, getting two ATP. Once we established this, our ancestors were able to energetically run circles around everything else. That's why all these multicellular organisms you look at, you, me, plants, animals, anything, that's got a mitochondria in it, and churning out this much energy is, in general, really complex and top of the food chain. Not at all. And we're going to learn about them in just a minute. Now, it's important to note, I was talking about glucose. Bear in mind, this process is not only for glucose. Other molecules come in at different stages. You cannot live on sugar alone as much as you may want to. Uh, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, are all broken down, but they come in at different stages. So you're gonna eventually end up with the same basic um, parts, but you have to break them down a little to get there. And they might come in after pyruvate, they might come in farther in the Krebs cycle, but they still come into it. That ATP synthase is something, right? So we went through chemiosmosis. We talked about how the high energy electrons that were the products of the Krebs cycle, so the NADH, the FADH2, take their electrons, they drop them off the electron transport chain. And that uh, is occurring in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. And the electrons jump from molecule to molecule. And when they jump, they do work. And the work they do is they push hydrogen across the barrier. Um, so you're building up a, a heavy hydrogen ion or proton gradient on one side of the barrier, not the other. That means that all of those protons, all those free hydrogen ions want to get back through to the other side, but they can't. The only way they can get through is through ATP synthase. And as they go through ATP synthase, the ATP synthase spins around and it grabs an ADP and a phosphate, so a benzene diphosphate, the phosphate, and it spins. And as it's spinning, it pushes them together to create a benzene triphosphate mechanically. It is a phenomenal process and amazing how it evolved to give aerobic organisms a, an evolutionary advantage just when they needed it. Um, now, I, I want to make sure that we understand that we are not just breaking down glucose. We do not survive on glucose alone, but other substrates 
can provide um, the electrons that you need in order to power this chemiosmosis as well, uh, fats, carbohydrates, and so on, um, and proteins. You break things down, you steal their electrons, those electrons can do work. The work is push hydrogen across a gradient, uh, across a barrier, create a gradient, get energy through ATP synthase. Yeah, there we go. That's uh, It's a little bit of a lot. These content review questions are here to really focus your studies. Uh, in the next mini lecture, we're going to go over what happens when you have no oxygen. We'll talk about two processes. We'll talk about fermentation, which is anaerobic, as well as anaerobic cellular respiration. Respiration in the cell that occurs without any oxygen. It's like magic, but it's not magic. It's science.